Hello, welcome again to Highbody Accounts. And today we're just going to proceed with our topic, decision making and the environment of risk and uncertainty. Just, just like you see here. So we're just going to take a look on environment of both risk and uncertainty. For the previous video, uh, you will just go uh, and find it out. All right. Uh, now we can proceed. Decision making and the risk. Now, you have to know the difference between uh, this different decision making and the risk as well as decision making and uncertainty. When speaking of decision making and the risk, it means that uh, we somehow we have a clue, we have a clue about what we're going to do. For example, we have probabilities of occurrence. Let's say you just need to do a certain project, but you know that when the weather is good, the, the amount of your, the chance of obtaining something, and when weather is bad. So you would know the possibilities of those weather to, to encounter, right? And in that way, uh, you can just be able to determine the probabilities. So as for decision-making under risk here, we say that probabilities of occurrence of events are known, say due to past experience. Let's say uh, you have done something already over the year, and then you have compared uh, the period of when weather was good and when weather was bad, and you can just uh, come up with the probability, actually in form of relative frequency. But don't worry about this, this will be given. All right, so when dealing with decision making under risk, we usually use expected value. An expected value is simply a long run average. It's just an average of a long term. When something is repeated several times, that's what we mean by expected value. That's why I'm writing here, expected value is a long run average. Long run, not necessarily at time, is it could be that something is repeated several times, several times, and they usually are, uh, if you say several times, it could, it could span over a certain period of time, right? So, meaning that it is relevant if a decision is repeated several times, such that all steps of nature would expect it to be crossed. You know, if you do something repetitively, you, it, it is possible that you will encounter all steps of nature, all situations, right? Yeah, so that's what uh, you need to know. And uh, another thing that you need to know here is uh, to know what kind of decision makers like to use expected value? We will call this risk neutral decision maker. You know, when speaking of risk neutral decision makers, it's just an expected value, simply a long run average. So when when you're trying to determine the average, it's not like you're trying to go to the extreme to the lowest value or highest value. No, it's like you're just trying to, to strike a middle ground, right? So that's what I, need, I needed to say. But also these expected values, you know, to be relevant, uh, something should be repeated several times. That's one of the drawbacks. So if something is just a one-off decision, it's not advised uh, to use the expected value approach. But also reliability or probabilities. You know, most probabilities, are, if this, uh, this, this method can be used usually when you have experience about something. Having experience about something uh, could mean that you, are, you have used past information to determine this probability. And so the past may not be re relevant to the future. And so reliability of probabilities computed could be questionable. I hope I uh, just got me. Now uh, we, just need, we just need to head uh, to the real scenarios uh, on how to determine these expected values now. As for the approach of expected values, actually, we, we, have, we usually have two common approaches, although uh, the most commonly used one is the first. There is something we call expected monetary value, expected monetary value, but also have something called expected opportunity loss. So this one is computed in terms of value added, but this one is computed in terms of, of the loss. All right. So obviously, when you're speaking of the value added, you need to maximize this value. That's why we say the decision giving the maximum EMV or expected monetary value is chosen. All right? As opposed to expected opportunity loss, where we say the decision giving the minimum expected opportunity loss because you try to avoid the loss as maximum as possible. So the one giving the minimum opportunity loss actually should be taken. Now, how to obtain this expected value? All expected values, even from the quantitative method subject, when you when speak of expected monetary value, it's simple. You just take the payoff, you multiply by probability. From the previous video, we took a look at the payoff. The payoff could simply mean maybe profit. Maybe when you're doing a certain business and the weather is good, you would obtain a profit of $1 million. That's just an example. So just take the payoff, you multiply by probability. Another payoff, 
that would be the, another payoff will be until until all payoffs to, for the given decision are over and then you add them up you sum them up that's why you the summation line here all right so that's what you have to do and if we expect the opportunity to lose now let's finish up with this and then you can just come on example if we expect the opportunity loss the same expected opportunity loss equals to instead of saying payoff now we call this regret so you take regret time probability what do i mean by regret you know uh when speaking of the term regret uh let's say maybe when the weather is good you have to, you have three options of doing business right yeah let me show you on um, let me illustrate this let's say that uh you have encountered something maybe you have business a you have business a and then you have business b just like that and actually you also have the other business here that is business c just like that you have three business right and maybe let's say that the weather is good good weather let's say there is good weather so in the case there is good weather let's say oh if for business a you then you, you obtain 10 million dollars for business b you obtain 12 million dollars but for business c let's say you obtain only nine million dollars now you are told what choice are you going to make it's obvious that since these are values, you would need to under when the weather is good, you would need to undertake business A, B, business B, sorry, because it would give you the maximum payoff, right? So you would prefer this one of twelve million dollars. Now, why why do what what is the regret now? Regret, what does it mean? Even before taking a look at this formula here, it's just easy. The regret is. Everyone would need to do business B because uh, I would give the maximum value of $12 million. If you do business A, you will obtain $10 million and you, you, you would regret missing out on the $2 million extra. $12 million times 10. So this would be the regret. As if you do business B, you won't have any regret because you would have recouped the maximum amount possible. So it would be near them. And if for business C, you would obtain $9 million but you would regret not being able to obtain 12 million. So you would regret not being able to, to obtain 3 million more. So this is what we speak of the regret. And that's why when speaking of the regret, you would need to minimize the regret. Someone who needs to maximize the value would come here to business B, 12 million. But also someone who, who needs to minimize the regret would come here, this is this regret. So actually both are, uh, Expected opportunity loss and expected monetary value would, would bring uh, the same conclusion, would, would lead the decision maker to the same conclusion. So, in summary, how do you obtain the regret? Regret is simply the maximum payoff for a given event minus all payoffs in that event. I'm very, very specific about the event. Do not just take the whole table, you just go to each event separately and take the maximum and then deduct the other, not the maximum in the table, but the maximum in each event or simply called state of nature. So this is what you need to know, right? Okay, now uh, we can just take a look at this example down here. The example says, HA Limited provide the following information about a product, Super H, that it trades, right? Okay. We have weekly demand for super H, 100, 120, and 140. We have probability of demand 0 0.4, 0 0.25, and 0 0.35. And further information is that the super H costs 3,000 to the F, and its selling price is 1,000 to the F. The super H unsold at the end of the week are disposed of at the net proceeds of 2,500. So that's the information that you are given from the question, right? There are goods that you will sell, and there are those that you won't be able to sell, and you have to dispose them at a much less amount. You know, the the selling price of five thousand, but you have to sell them at to dispose them at just two thousand five hundred. And also, we are told also there is a penalty of four hundred to the S per unit H A fails to deliver. So, if you deliver in excess. You would have to dispose them at a much less amount, all right. And uh, in case you fail to deliver, you also have to pay a penalty of four hundred for each unit you fail to deliver. All right. The requirement now. 
we are told using the expected value approach, advise the company on the number of super H to purchase weekly. Use either expected monetary value or expected opportunity loss approach. So uh, we'll start with expected monetary value approach, but actually uh, we first have to make a table, right? Okay, so this would be the solution here. Yeah. Yeah, we just say that we're just trying to use the expected value approach and we are choosing the expected monetary value. So I just take the summation of payoff and probability just like this one. So first of all, we have the probabilities, but we do not have the payoff. So we have to determine the payoff state. All right, now you have to make a decision. You know, when speaking of this one, you have to know what you do. You have to know the decision and know the, the states of nature. Now, the state of nature may be depend, just depend on the demand because uh, the demand sometimes won't be given directly in an exam. For example, here we are, the question told us, advise what, advise the company on the number of supplies to purchase weekly. How many supplies should be purchased? The only chances here are 100, 120, and 140. So these are the decisions that we make. It's either you purchase 100, 120 or 140, right? But also, since you're not given the state of nature, we could just say the same thing demand could be state of nature, right? So the demand of 100, state of nature is 0 0.4. 120, state of nature is 0 0.25. And for 140, state of nature would be actually the demand of 140. And we have their probabilities. So all you need to know now is first of all to determine this payoff, right? Now, Something costs 3,000, and if you sell it, you sell it for 5,000, you earn a profit of 2,000. But those unsold are disposed of at 2,500. So you would pay 3,000, but you would sell for 2,500. So you get a loss of 500. So it really depends on the situation. But also, there is a penalty of 400 per each unit, which A fails to deliver. Now, let's just go and prepare our team. So, you have to come here and prepare this table here. Yeah? So I would have the demand here, yeah? just like the, the states of nature. I can have 100, 120, and 140. And let's say that for the column, we make our decision. So these are our decisions. You choose either to purchase 100. You can choose to purchase 120 here, yeah? but also you can choose to purchase 140, just like that. And then we have the probability from the question. At the demand of 100, probability was 0 0.4. Demand of 120, probability was 0 0.25. And the demand of 140, probability was 0 0.35. So all you need to know is to determine these figures here. These ones are what we call payoffs. These figures here, these ones are the, are the payoffs. So you need to determine them all. So how are we going to achieve that, right? So you have to start first. Maybe when we are purchasing 100 units, and then you compare with this demand. You purchase 100 units, but the demand you can do 100. You can purchase 100 units while the demand is 120. And you can purchase 100 units while the demand is 140. So it really depends on the scenario that you're just going to encounter, all right? Okay, so uh, that's what we have to go and start. Now let's go to the workings here. So before anything, we just simplify matters I have to say, if you sell something on a normal sale, we set the selling price of 5,000 and the cost of 3,000, so you retain the profit of 2,000. But in case uh, you fail to sell, you have, you have purchased, but you cannot sell, you have to dispose it, but you just dispose it at, at, at proceeds of 2,500. But remember, you incur the cost of 3,000, so you have a loss of 500. And we have been told from the question that the penalty per unit of undelivered units. So if you fail to deliver unit, that means that you have not purchased, but also you have not obtained the sales, but actually you have to pay just a penalty of 400, right? Now, we have to start from the purchase of 100 units, 120 as well as 140. That's easy then, you can just start from purchase of 100 units now. So here we are, we say, for the purchase of 100 units, when you purchase 100 units, it's not necessary that there, there will be that demand. So we are saying, when the demand is 100 units, 
you have purchased 100 units and the demand is 100 units. That means that you're going to sell all the units. So that would be simple. So the payoff would be 100 units and profit per unit. And we say if you sell at a profit, you, you get a profit of 2,000. So if you multiply here, you would get 200,000. Then you come again. For the purchase of 100 units, but now the demand is 120 units. If the demand is 120 units, you have purchased 100 units. But 120 units are demanded. That means you cannot fulfill that demand. So you would only have to sell 100 units here, and uh, you would fail to deliver these 20 units. As for 100 units that you have sold, you retain a profit of 2,000 per unit, just like this. And as for these 20 units that you have failed to deliver, you would have to pay the penalty of 400 per unit. So 100 and 2,000 minus 20 times 400, you would obtain 192,000, right? This is what you encounter. And then uh, we just come to when the demand equals 140 units. So the same. You have purchased 100, but 140 are demanded. So you would be able to sell 100 at a profit of 2,000 each. And if for those 40 units, you have to pay a penalty of 400 each. If you multiply and you did that there, you have 184,000. So that's what you have to do. So you would have those figures. At 100, you would have 200,000 here, 182,000 here, and 184,000 here. So you just come to the purchase of 120 units. So you do it here and you can this ones. That purchase of 140, you do the same. Just remember to know when you have the profit on normal sale, when you have loss on disposal, and when you have the penalty on undelivered units. All right, so let's go for the purchase of 120 units. Here we are. For the purchase of 120 units, how are we going to do this? Now you ask yourself. When I purchase 120 units, but the demand is 100 units, that means I would have purchased in excess of what is demanded, of what can be sold. So I would have to sell 100 units, but I would remain with 20 units, which I would have to dispose at a loss of 500. For this 100 units that I successfully sold on a normal sale, I would obtain the profit of 2,000. So 100 and 2,000. Minus 20 times 500, and you will obtain 190,000, right? Okay, and now uh, we are on this one when the demand is 120 units. Now, see here, you purchase 120 units, but the demand is 120 exact units. So it simply means that all 120 units will be sold at that profit of 2,000. You multiply and you have 240,000. And then when the demand now is 140 units, what do you do here? When the demand is 140 units, then you ask yourself, all right, I've purchased 120, but 140 are demanded. That means I'm not able to satisfy the demand of all the customers. So I have no choice, but, I will, but only to sell 120 units and accepting that I failed to deliver 20 units, which are, Actually, if you fail to deliver, what did we say? We said that we'd incur a penalty of 400. So 400 per unit. For this one, when the data is sold, you'd obtain the profit of 2,000. But by that, you'd have 232,000, right? You just come on the table here and fill them. You just come and fill them on the table here. All right, so you fill it there, you fill there, and you just come here on purchase of 120, you fill. Then at the last point, you are on the purchase of 140 units. Now, how are you going to deal with that purchase of 140 units? Right, you can just head there. So purchase, purchase of 140 units. So now I've purchased 140 units, but only 100 units are demanded. That means I have units in excess. So I would have to sell 100 units at a profit of 2,000 each. And as for those 40 units, actually, I would have to dispose them at a loss of 500. So 100 times 2,000 minus 40 times 500, you remain with 180,000. All right, now, you have purchased 140, but the demand is 120. Still, you have purchased more than required. 
So we'll sell 120 at a profit of 2,000 each. As for the remaining 20, you will have to dispose them at a loss of 500. You know how to remember, if you have a loss, this will be minus, right? And if you have a tenant, this will be minus. So do not be surprised with this minus sign. And actually, you would end up getting this value here, this figure, just like that. And also, let's say, uh, when the demand is 140, you demand one, customers demand 140 units, but you have, you have also purchased 140. So it's easy, you just sell them all. So I would sell all 140 units at uh, a profit of 2,000 each, which would be 280,000 units, just like that, all right? Yeah. So that's what you have to do. You just have to come up here and plug them those figures, all those figures. You just come here, you plug the figures. Uh, I gave 140 when demand is 100, when demand 120, and when the demand is 140, just like that. And now I uh, can determine your expected monetary value. We say you just come for each decision, you just take the page off and multiply by the probability. So, as for expected monetary value, how did you obtain these figures here? 200,000 times 0 0.4 plus 102,000 times 0 0.25 plus 184,000 times 0 0.35. And this would be 192,400. So that's what I just going to do. You repeat again for the decision of purchase of 120 units. 190,000 times 0 0.4 plus 240,000 times 0 0.25 plus 232,000 times 0 0.35. If you add them all, you'd obtain this figure here. And lastly, is for purchase of 140, 180,000 times 0 0.4, 230,000 times 0 0.25, 280,000 times 0 0.35, you sum them all and you end up having this value here, all right? So if you need to choose the decision, because our main goal here is to determine the decision to make. So how are you going to determine the decision that you need to make? As for the decision, you just ask yourself, uh, since you just need the maximum, you're, just, you're using the expect the monetary value, you need to, mark, to determine the maximum value. What is the maximum EMV? The maximum EMV equals to 2,700, right? This one, because this one and the two, 217, 227, so this one is the highest. So since it's the highest, it corresponds to this decision of purchasing 140. And that's why we say HA should purchase 140 super H, right? Yeah, so that's what uh, the question entailed. But actually, I need us to use the expected opportunity loss approach now. But actually, we're just going to see this in, in the next video, all right? So if you haven't subscribed, I advise you to do that uh, so that you can receive regular updates. Thank you very much, and until next time.